Hello, uh, thank you for tuning into our Facebook live stream. Uh, we are now broadcasting across Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall Police. Uh, today we'll be taking some questions that you've left on our Facebook pages in the last week. Uh, those have been submitted uh, across the Dorset Police Facebook page and the Devon and Cornwall Police Facebook page. Uh, those predominantly around cycling and what we're here to do today is to sort of look at some of those um, comments and some of those myths that have been um, commented on our pages and uh, try and dispel some of those. We've got a panel of four experts that have joined us for the live stream and I'd now like to introduce them to you and starting from the left. Hi, I'm Lisa Dawn and I'm Associate Professor of Driver Behaviour at Cranfield University. Good evening, I'm Felix Young. I'm the Regional Events Officer for the South of uh, England, which is British Cycling. Good evening, I'm Inspector Joe Parley from Dorset Police. I'm the Alliance Road Police Inspector. So I'm in charge of dealing with uh, road offences and also investigating serious and fatal road traffic collisions. Good evening, my name is James Richards. I'm a driving instructor, an approved driving instructor, and deliver the driver awareness courses for Dorset Police. Lovely, thank you all for joining us. Um, so as I said, we've got uh, several questions. Um, thank you to everyone who's joining us on the feed. I can see we've got around about 500 people watching us live as we speak at the moment, so it's really great to have you all with us. So the first question we've got um, is from Chris Guy. He left his comment on the Dorset Police Facebook page and he said, why can motorists get done for being less than 1.5 metres, uh, less than 1.5 metres away from the cycling off person when overtaking, yet for, it's okay for cyclists to fly down the inside and only leave a six inch gap between them and the car? Is it because it's easier to get money out of the motorists? Joe, do you want to have a view on that? Yeah, so I think it's all about trying to protect our road users. Uh, we talk about the 1.5 metres, this is guidance to try and give people an idea of how much space to leave either a cyclist, horse rider, whatever it might be, a parked car. What we want to try and do is to give people enough space so if a cyclist changes their course or direction, at least it gives that opportunity not to be involved in a collision, which is what we're trying to do. Um, so uh, in terms of the 1.5 metres, you know, it's not 1.5 metres and that's it. This is around 1.5 metres being a guidance, depends what sort of road you're on, what sort of environment you're in. We're talking about giving people enough space to be safe. Um, so that's what uh, the first part of the question. Second part of the question in terms of cyclists going down the inside uh, of a tr stream of traffic, well clearly we would advise people to you know, look at the circumstances, C cyclists, look at the circumstances. If it's a long line of stationary traffic, then just be aware that there may be cars either turning left, turning right, so just filter safely. So it's all around having a safe space, giving yourself time and space to be able to change course or direction without causing uh, really to come into collision with each other. Brilliant, um, thanks very much. Um, and if you're joining us, um, do feel free to leave some comments uh, in the comments below and we'll aim to look at some of those comments later on in the, uh, in the stream. Uh, Dan has asked, uh, why can't we have the 1.5 metre for a reason signs like in other counties? Uh, car drivers in other areas do not give enough space to cyclists and then when, we do, when you do show frustrations to them at traffic lights, uh, they're completely oblivious that the law exists. Lisa, what's your view on that? Well, just because there are a lot of signs doesn't mean that people are actually going to attend to them. So more signs doesn't necessarily mean that people will drive safer or ride safer. Um, actually, making sure that people think sensibly about what they're doing is a far better strategy to educate road users rather than just put up the signs and expect them to look at them. Lovely. And um, a question coming in uh, from David in Devon and Cornwall. Uh, he's uh, submitted a question directly for yourself. Um, I read a paper that not wearing a helmet led to drivers uh, giving passing space of six inches greater than dri uh, cyclists wearing one. Are there better behaviours or clothing I could wear that would encourage safer behaviours from drivers? So it's really a good idea to wear reflective clothing because you need to make sure that people can see you. And so increasing your conspicuity is, is critical to making sure that people are aware that you're there. Um, now, the problem is that when it comes to the majority of road users, that of course are vehicles, they often overlook the cyclist, they often overlook these vulnerable road users. And so making sure that you, are, you can be seen is, is really important for safety. And, and Felix, um, from the British cycling point of view, what's your, what's your take on that? So I think being, taking responsibility for your, your safety on the road is, is a very important thing and, and there are ways to be seen that will help keep you safe. But I think it's also very important that um, we're trying to normalise cycling and, and, and in countries where they do start to enforce rules about having to wear certain items of clothing and, and, and so on and helmets, 
actually you end up without reducing the number of incidents because you're making it more difficult, you're putting up barriers to people taking to the streets and, and, and riding their bikes. And so actually the people on bikes are normal people and the, the Dutch model, very few people wear a helmet and they have a lot of people that feel safe cycling on the road. So there's a, there's a balance between the two of, of taking measures to make sure that you're safe and, and, and can be seen, but also we have to be very careful not to put up barriers to people taking part in cycling and seeing it as a non-normal activity. Of course. Um, and just sort of leading on from that, um, David um, has asked, how, are drivers, how, how do drivers measure the gap? Uh, how do the police measure the gap at the same time uh, when they prosecute the motorist? What if the cyclist, what if the cyclist meanders uh, where you are going alongside? What's your view on that? So that's almost exactly the point of the 1.5 metre guidance is that a cyclist is a vulnerable road user and it's included in the highway code and, and in driving instructors when, when they're delivering lessons is that you have to be anticipating that there might be something that will cause a cyclist to wobble or swerve and that is exactly why the guidance is in place to, to suggest that you need to make sure you're leaving extra uh, space and making, taking extra care when you're overtaking a cyclist because a cyclist will normally do everything they can to avoid swerving and wobbling but there are often factors such as potholes, gusts of winds and so on that might cause them to do so. Brilliant and uh, moving on to cycle lanes, it's another key kind of topic that people have been discussing with us. Uh, can dog walkers keep dogs on leads when on designated cycle paths and when dark ensures have dogs have lights on? Um, sooner or later there is going to be serious incident here. The vast majority of dog owners' common sense prevails, but as usual it's the majority and the minority sorry, that presents a danger. That came from Andre Clark. Um, James, what's your view on that? Um, dogs should be on leads anyway. Um, the Highway Code clearly states that dogs should be on leads. Um, and I think it just makes common sense. It's what we sort of spoke about earlier on about being seen. Having a, a light on a dog um, so cyclists can see it just makes common sense. And uh, moving on from that, Mikey Ash, uh, he's come in to say uh, cyclists using the road when a cycle path is available, slowing down the whole flow of traffic and causing big traffic jams. Should it be illegal and punishable? Felix, I'm sure you've got a view from British Cycling on that one. <laughs> so cyclists are road users the same way as anyone in any other form of vehicle. And I think what's a really relevant point around this question is that there, cycling is quite a broad uh, thing. We're referring to in this conversation everything from someone that's using cycling as a utility to, to get to work or to school or, or to the shops, all the way through to someone that might be competing in a sport or using it as a leisure activity and I think the previous question about dogs and having to adjust the way that you're cycling on a shared path brings it back to this point around adjusting your riding and it wouldn't be safe for a cyclist that would be travelling at high speeds above 20 miles an hour to, to, to use a shared path where there might be dogs or other pedestrians and so on and so um, the, the highway code sees cyclists in the same way as it sees another vehicle user on the road and whereas cycling lanes are there to provide for cyclists should they need them there isn't an obligation for cyclists to have to use those okay um ian may has been in touch uh, he's a cyclist himself he says this is a serious question from a cyclist who designs the cycle paths in our cities and towns if you take topsham road in exeter it starts on the left hand path then it crosses to the right hand path then into a bus lane back onto a path then across to the other side of the road. This is how to navigate just one road. No wonder cyclists don't use them. I think a number of them need to be designed again. Um, Joe, I know um, you might have a view on this. I know it's probably something more for a local authority to answer, but what's the kind of police perspective on that one? So, as you said, the local authority are responsible for, for creating and building the infrastructure around cycle lanes, cycle tracks. And what we have to remember is that the road network's been in place for a long, long time, and, and really cycle lanes, cycle tracks are things that come along in the last, you know, decade, two decades. So actually we're trying to build infrastructure on top of the existing road network. Now the local authority uh, have various factors in when they when they build the cycle lanes, looking at collision data. Ultimately they're trying to make it the safest place for a cyclist to travel. Uh, so whilst uh, somebody might think it's uh, inconvenient, the, the route that's being provided for them, actually it's trying to make the best use of the infrastructure that's already there. Um, they do go through an audit process to make sure that it's safe Yes, it might not be the most direct, but, but safety is the key issue around uh, the, the building of cycle lanes and cycle tracks. Thank you. Um, so uh, we've had a question in on the Devon Cornwall page. Uh, why is it not compulsory for a cyclist to ride on a cycle path instead of the road when one is available? As this is usually signed with a blue sign with a, bi a, a bike on it, when a blue sign means you must, according to the highway code, could still ride on the road. Cyclists could still ride on the road. James, you're the expert in, in, in it comes to the highway code uh, as a cycling instructor, driving instructor. What's your view on that? I think it goes to, to what Felix said earlier on about cyclists do not have to use uh, a cycle path. 
um, that the blue sign means this is a route for cycles. It doesn't actually mean that they have to use them. Um, if you look at a lot of the cycles now, um, I mean, would it be safe for a cyclist to be on a path with a pedestrian when they're doing 25, 30 miles an hour? Um, so our next group of questions, we've looked at a few groups so far. Our next one is around bike equipment, so things like lights um, and that sort of thing. Um, Sherry Porter has asked on the Dorset Police Facebook page, uh, do cyclists have to have a bell? And please tell me what the side of the cycle path is for pedestrians to walk on. Felix, what's your view? Uh, so cyclists do not have to ride with a bell. Cycles have to be sold with a bell, but there is no obligation for riders to, to have that attached. I think... Obviously a bell is a very useful tool for a cyclist to help communicate where they are and, and that they are approaching. Um, one thing that we often encourage, especially if you've got riders that choose not to have a bell on their bicycle, is to, to, to communicate. That, and I think we've, we've spoken a bit about tolerance and, and sharing, sharing spaces, sharing the roads, sharing paths. And actually using your, your ability to communicate, so that might be your voice, if you, if you haven't got a bell, is a really important thing, especially in, in the situation where you've got a shared path. Um, on the second part of the question around, uh, sorry, can you remind me the second part? Of the question? So, um, when when it comes to which side of the path should which pedestrians, path? so this is probably around shared space. Yeah, so shared space, and, it, and again, it, some shared spaces have a specific. Uh, the signage will indicate that there will be one side of the path for pedestrians, one part, side of the path for cycles, and but quite a lot of time there's a sign that will indicate the whole path is shared, and and that's almost specifically trying to make the point that this is a shared path and you need to adjust the way you're riding and using it, be that as a pedestrian or a cyclist, accordingly. Um, so whereas in busy paths you might end up with a flow of, of pedestrian and cycle traffic on the left-hand side going both directions, um, in a shared space you have to be ready to share that space with whoever might be in that space. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so uh, Thomas Morse uh, has asked, uh, he was on his way back to, uh, to work this morning, uh, he has a gripe with the number of cyclists wearing dark clothing um, with no lights on their bikes. Um, why is there no drive to tackle this behaviour? Lisa, from a behaviour change psychologist point of view, what's your, your view on that one? Well, um, the uh, police perspective would be that uh, there's, there's, there's a, a, an issue around making sure that people can be seen, um, but uh, y y there's no compulsion. Um, getting people to change their behaviour is, is clearly something that is desirable here, and um, within the, uh, the lines there's a lot of emphasis on driver education, where behaviour change techniques are being used to try and encourage and influence the way that people respond. And, and Joe, from a policing perspective, what's your view? So the, the law quite clearly states around what cyclists must have in terms of lighting. So they must have a front and a rear light. Uh, and, and that can be flashing if it's, uh, if that would help make them conspicuous. So th there is clear legislation that talks around lighting. In terms of clothing, there is no legislation, but as we talked around earlier, it's about making yourself be seen. Uh, so clearly from an investigation point of view, when I have to deal with, with the worst case scenario, you know, we, we ask the question, would this person be able to be seen? So lights are, you know, makes sense to have lights. Reflectors, makes sense to have reflectors. And where possible, wear light clothing the better that you can be seen the less likely you're going to come into conflict with other vehicles and you're going to be more conspicuous so the law is quite clear around uh, lighting clothing is is a more difficult uh, conversation <laughs> to have but clearly the lighter the clothing the better you are to be seen and uh, Anne Marie has uh, asked the question uh, why are bikes not sold with front and back lights and a bell I'm from Germany and bikes are where already fitted when they bought them from the, the, the shops and retailers. Uh, James, what's your view on that from, from an instructor's point of view? Uh, my understanding is that um, bikes should be sold with a bell and also reflectors on that, on that cycle. However, it's not part of the law to have a cycle on your bike when you're, when you're using it on the road. Um, I, mean, I think common sense would, would prevail and say, I've got a, a cycle bell. Just, just to maybe warn a horse that you're coming up behind a horse or something like that, just to ring a bell and it's shown that respect for other road users on our roads, isn't it? Thank you. Um, Steve Groom has asked, uh, what's the score with the mega bright flashing lights being used by some cyclists? They blind motorists and almost cause an accident, often used by delivery cyclists, delivery riders and many other uh, branded uh, right, cycling riders as well. Um, Felix, what's your, your view on that? I think it's, it is an interesting contradiction that cyclists face is that we have simultaneous almost questions of how, how we're not visible enough and it's too dark and yet also <laughs> we're too bright and too easily of seen. Of course. Um, I think, uh, so I 
commute by, by bike and I live in, in two towns that have country roads between the two of them and so I need a light that's bright enough for me to be able to see where I'm going the same way as a car with headlights would just particularly during the winter. Um, so I have a bright light for that reason, um, however it's one that doesn't flash because of, of the issues highlighted in the question, um, but it's more of a constant beam or kind of a pulsing one. Um, I think that the reason for the kind of the bright flashing lights probably comes down to some of the stuff that Lisa is talking about is it's actually it's a fear thing and I think as the technology has developed and, and bike lights can be brighter and in an affordable way people have gone well I want to make sure I'm seen I'm going to light myself up like a Christmas tree <laughs> and whilst that it probably is less helpful than it could be in, in, in terms of the question that's the approach people are going to the advice which is to be seen so uh, it, is a, it is a very difficult one but it does come from fear and if people were in a position where they weren't as scared on the roads effectively you might have a position if that they wouldn't need feel the need to take those measures brilliant thank you um anthony i think this is a question coming in your direction lisa uh, anthony has asked uh, don't you think it should be law to wear helmets for cyclists as more and more accidents are happening and high visibility clothing should be worn yeah, and it's something that we've already mentioned, and uh, clearly, you know, in in certain types of incidents, having a helmet on is going to protect you. So uh, it's useful uh, to make sure that you are protected. In other circumstances, a helmet may not be something that is uh, something you would like to do. I mean, Felix will probably talk about that as well. Um, but certainly, you know, I would encourage um, people to be wearing helmets because in, in, in many incidents, especially more serious ones, it will protect the most important part of your anatomy, which is you know, the way that uh, the brain is, 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 is organised. You, you really don't want to be hitting the ground too hard. But having said that, um, there isn't really going to be any protection. And so you know, in a serious incident where you're impacted at speed, and, um, and, and actually, um, there isn't really much we can do apart from improve driver behaviour and make sure that cyclists are less vulnerable. And as Lisa mentioned there, Felix, you've probably got a view on helmets. What's your view on yeah, so British I've, cycling? I've got through far too many bike helmets to not wear a helmet. Uh, I've cracked many a helmet rather than my skull, fortunately. Uh, and so the, I, when I'm riding my bike for leisure, if I'm riding fast, riding out on, on country roads, I'd never choose not to wear a helmet. Um, however, there are situations where actually if you were mandating helmets you would actually make cycling less safe which might be in a setting where you've got people making short trips and and, and again it's, it's about not creating barriers to people taking cycling as an active travel option um, and not creating this false illusion of security around if someone's wearing a helmet I can be that little bit more reckless and so that's I think where this this question about seeing cycling for the kind of the broad range of activities that can be under that umbrella is, is really important and, and adjusting the way that we're expecting people to behave but also adjusting the way we treat them on the roads and how we share those space with them accordingly. Brilliant, thank you. So um, just so you know, if you're just joining us, um, you're watching a live stream from Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall Police. Um, we advertised this around a week ago on our Facebook pages and invited our followers to submit questions to us um, to put to our panel who join us today. Uh, we've got several of those questions. We had over 600 comments. Clearly we can't go through all of them and some of them uh, were a bit duplicated. So we've tried to sort of bring in all the different types of questions that are brought, but if your question's not been answered, we have aimed to cover every thematic area that's been asked of us in the questions. Um, so if we go back to the panel again, I don't know if you want to introduce yourselves again for anyone who's just joined us, um, starting from the left. Uh, Lisa Dawn, uh, Associate Professor of Driver Behaviour at Cranfield University. Uh, Felix Young, the Regional Events Officer for the South for British Cycling. I'm Inspector Joe Pardy from Dorset Road Policing Team. I'm the uh, an Alliance Road Police Inspector and I deal with uh, enforcement education road policing and also dealing with facial and serious road traffic collision investigation. Uh, James Richards, an approved driving instructor and I deliver the courses for Dorset Police for the driver awareness courses and get involved in other road safety projects. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for joining us. So moving on to some more questions that we've had in. Uh, Ron has asked... Uh, why do cyclists still ride down the near side of HGVs when there is an audible warning stating the vehicle is turning left? I know, Lisa, that a number of collisions involving cyclists are when a vehicle is turning left. Just what's your mm. view on that? Yes, I mean, there's some uh, shocking blind spots and uh, unfortunately um, there is a, a kind of a, 
situation where you both have the cyclists and the uh, drivers that don't really understand um, the perspective of each other. And so uh, it's important that cyclists don't get caught up in a, in a difficult situation where the, 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 the truck driver haven't act, hasn't actually seen them. Uh, a lot of serious uh, incidents happen in these kind of circumstances. Um, increasingly technology has been put into vehicles to help um, alert drivers around these blind spots, um, but really there's nothing that can protect you more than making sure that you keep your distance and properly look in all your mirrors before turning. And I think going on top of that, I think it's around putting yourselves in the other person's shoes. So mm -hmm. a cyclist, to put yourselves in, for example, a lorry driver's you know, shoes and think, you know, if I come up the near side, are they going to be able to see me? Probably not. And the lorry driver to think, well, I'll just make that last check again, just to make sure there isn't a cyclist there. So, you know, we talked a lot about road respect and having respect for other road users. So we've all got to try and think, am I, what I'm about to do, have I done everything I can to make sure I've done been safely, I'm not going to cause anyone any danger? And, and that applies to all road users, whether you're a horse rider, a driver, a pedestrian, or a cyclist, or a motorcycle user. Yes. Uh, okay, so the next question we've had in, um, that was from Susan. She's asked, on county country lanes, uh, do they have the right to ride two abreast or more with total disregard for the traffic behind them? Now, I know um, from our work around social media, this is a comment that quite often comes up around cyclists riding two abreast. Um, James, just do you want to touch on the highway code rules first before we kind of delve a little bit deeper with that one? Yeah, the highway code states that... Um it never ride more than two abreast and then ride in single file on narrow busy roads when riding around bends. And it's something that comes up in our drive awareness courses again and again and again. And it's just having an understanding of, of the highway code and also having respect for the other road user on the road. Um, cyclists are allowed to use the road just as well as, as car drivers are. Um, but it's also it's, it's down to the cyclists as well to go single file if they're on a narrow road. Um, and it's not necessarily the cyclist that's holding anybody up. It's the vehicles coming towards them. And at the end of the day, how long are they going to be held up for? A lot of people think it's going to be hours, but in actual fact, it's probably about 15, 30 seconds. And I think, and I think there's, a, there's a thing around um, when a driver overtakes, obviously they have to, to cross the, the other side of the carriageway to give enough space. And when you're overtaking with a two abreast cyclist, you're actually uh, shortening that time. You're on the opposite side of the carriageway. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, and, and cyclists are, are, are now um, trained to ride to a breast, but it said what we said earlier on about uh, giving as much room as you possibly can for a cyclist that might just wobble. Um, if you don't ride a, a, a cycle or a motorcycle for that case, you wouldn't understand that maybe a gust of wind can just take you across the road. So once again, it's having that respect for the other, other road user. So yeah, they're allowed to do that. And, and Felix, from your point of view as a cyclist, um, I'm sure you've got a strong view on riding to a breast. How does it make you feel when you're cycling in single file versus with someone alongside? So I'm always very aware of the, the drivers around me and the potential inconvenience that could be caused if you've got a small group of cyclists that might be riding to a breast and the perception there. I think one thing that I think is really important to me, and I run a team of teenage riders, so I've got 12 and 13 and 14 year olds that we're trying to introduce to, to training on the roads. And one thing that we try and really kind of build into their mindset is that if they are disciplined and are well drilled effectively so they're in neat lines and they're and they're they're taking things seriously so to speak the perception that drivers will see of them is of a group that know what they're doing and they aren't three wide and actually the chaos of a group might be what makes it seem like they're taking up more space than they deserve and so there's an element on the cyclist part to be organized and, and to, to take their safety on the road seriously um, and then hopefully that will then but drives in a position or other road is in a position where they feel that they're going to give a bit more respect as well. Um, but at the same time, what you said is very relevant about a, a, a group that's riding to a breast is if you follow the, the, the guidance and the rules properly, it's easier to overtake because I've been in groups where riders have been too nervous to ride to a breast and have ended up being in a single line, which then might stretch over a few hundred metres and actually overtaking that is almost impossible. We end up in a lot of dangerous situations where drivers will get halfway along the line, suddenly the, the, the overtake is no longer safe and then they're, and they're interacting with the middle of the group of cyclists and so actually part of it comes down to the skill of the riders and trying to kind of make sure that, that their responsibility is taken seriously but obviously that also then comes across the other way and, and understanding the, the, the rights that the cyclists have on the road so that you're not intimidating them or, or doing something that would not be tolerant and, and not be sharing the road with them. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, the other question that we often get asked um, uh, is coming through the Dorset Police Facebook page. Uh, why do, do police do nothing when cyclists cross roundabouts and then go through a red light in front of police cars? Um, Joe, um, I know many people watching this may have, have seen potentially uh, a cyclist go through a red light. Um, it's often stuff that we get fed back on our social media accounts that we, they, people quite regularly see. Um, what, what, what's the police's view on that? Okay, I can't comment on the individual cases of what has and hasn't been done, but cyclists are bound by legislation of, of lights and signs as other road users are. So uh, you know, if cyclists do choose to go through a red, red light or not comply with a traffic sign, they, they're guilty of an offence uh, and they, they can be fined £50, pounds, fixed penalty, and if they were to go to court it could be um, thousands of pounds. So, um, so that they do break the law. Why the police don't take action on those specific examples, I can't. I can't uh, comment. But I'd expect if people do witness that, then they should be dealt with. Um, a question that's come in on our No Excuse page. Our No Excuse team is a team of officers dedicated for proactive road safety enforcement, and that's across both Dorset and Devon and Cornwall. Um, they're, they're, they go out and do proactive operations, such as Operation Close Pass, which you'll hear about shortly. Um, Amanda has come in and asked, uh, how does the team deal with cyclists? and other roaders such as skateboarders, people using mobility scooters, who go the wrong way down a one-way street? Joe. Okay, so uh, again, cyclists are bound by the law. Skateboarders, um, motability scooters, uh, depending on the size, it's a, it's a really in-depth piece of legislation around motability scooters. So, so some aren't bound by legislation. Cyclists and vehicles are. Um, it's an interesting point. If there's issues in your local community, then I can only suggest that you, you make us aware so that we can we can go and tackle those where, where it needs to be. So it's a difficult question, really, because <laughs> some are bound by legislation, some aren't. Uh, so that does tie our hands somewhat. But um, but, it, but it goes back to the argument about mutual respect for all road users, doesn't yes. it? Um, so we've had a question in about, uh, are cyclists allowed to ride on a clear way? Uh, for example, dual carriageways that are clear ways with vehicles travelling at 70 miles an hour. Uh, why doesn't the law uh, do something about cyclists riding with no hands on handlebars uh, when on public highways using uh, guys in sports lycra? And why is it acceptable to ride a bike with both ears containing earphones? Uh, one should be sufficient listening to music. In a car you can have music on but you still have your ears unobstructed to listen to surrounding noise before anyone mentions car radios. Uh, that's come in from Sterl Benson. Um, Joe, what's the, the legislation point around that? Okay, it's quite a long question. So the first part around the roads that are being used. Uh, so dual carriageways, uh, clearways, uh, national speed limit. And as we discussed before, cycles are allowed to use roads, as anyone else is. Uh, there are restrictions on motorways, and some roads may have prohibitions of cycling, uh, which would be indicated by a, a white sign with a red uh, red outline with a cycle in it, which would prohibit cyclists. So. If a cyclist chooses to use a fast road, then, then they're entitled to do that. Clearly, you know, again, we talk around being seen, conspicuous, you, know, you have to take more care, but then so do the, the car drivers, the lorry drivers, have to then be aware that cyclists may be on those roads. So, so in terms of that first question, there is no prohibition other than on certain roads. Uh, the second part in terms of having earphones in, of course, whether you're a cyclist, a pedestrian, a horse rider, a car driver, lorry driver, whoever you are using the roads, then you need to be aware of your surroundings. So if you've got earphones in that are cancelling out the noise that's outside of your environment, then you're going to put yourself at risk because you can't hear what's going on. And, and of course, your senses, I'm sure Lisa would, would agree, your, your senses are narrowing. So actually you're taking away hearing, which is a massive thing if you're certainly on a cycle, on a horse, or even in a car, you hear sirens coming, for example. So of course, we wouldn't advise people to have earphones in because you want to be aware of your surroundings. Uh, and you're going to have to remind me the last part of the question. I think I think you pretty much covered it. I think uh, it was it was the point around you know cycling on a clear way and and the uh, music and um, the handlebars was and, the handle, other and no handle hands. So again, um, there's no specific offence of riding without your hands on the handlebars, but clearly you'll probably commit careless cycling because you're not in proper control of your cycle. The same as if you're driving your car. I wouldn't expect to see someone driving down the road without their hands on the steering wheel because you're not in control of of your vehicle, your cycle. Um, and you need to be because you don't know what's going to happen next. So uh, there are offensive careless cycling and or dangerous cycling, the same as there is in the car driving world. So you know, if you actually think about the question rather than direct it towards a cyclist, if you think of any road user, um, you could incorporate any of those subjects in that question to any road user. You need to be concentrating, not being distracted, 
and you need to be in control of whatever it is you are using on the road. And, and Lisa, coming to you, what's, what's your view on what's just been discussed around that? So uh, some of this uh, problem around distraction is uh, critical here in that um, we have a very limited capacity in the amount of information that we can process. And so any time that our attention is diverted towards something like music or um, perhaps lights, flashing lights, or uh, something that other people are doing around you, your attention is diverted towards processing information around that. And of course, therefore, you don't have sufficient attention left to, to process critical information about the roads and what you're going to um, uh, deal with next. So um, with music playing, it's, uh, it's, it's going to distract you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, now, Carlos de Silva, he's commented on the Dorset Police Facebook page uh, asking, uh, why not give cyclists the same rights as car drivers? I mean, making them get insurance, be visible at night, pay road tax as they get cycle lanes built for them. Now, uh, the subject of tax and its use on the roads, particularly around cycling, is, a, is a, another hot topic. It's probably the third kind of biggest thing that we, we get comments around on our social media accounts as well. Um, James, just what's, what's your views around that? Um, first of all, it's not a road tax. Um, it's an emissions tax. Uh, the road tax went out, I think, when Churchill was um, was Prime Minister, <laughs> and that was before my lifetime, I think. Um, it was certainly before mine. <laughs> of course. Uh, but it's, it's an emissions tax, so it's clearly cycles have got no emissions, but then you can look on the, on the other side of that, and um, what about our electric cars? There's a lot of electric cars, there are cars that have got zero tax on them at all. They don't pay tax. And, and, and Felix, from your point of view, from British Cycling, you know, you're, you're a cyclist yourself. Um, you must hear these comments a lot as well. Yes, and I think echo what was said about the, the, the funding for roads and cycleways comes from local authority funding. The, the road tax doesn't, well, the, the vehicle excise duty doesn't deliberately fund those things. From an insurance point of view, so I was hit by a car and taken away in an ambulance in 2017, and I benefited massively from the insurance that I have as a member of British Cycling. And... Uh, me and my wife have agreed that I will be a lifetime member from now on because it gives that element of security the same way as the obligation that drivers have to be insured so that there's that security around their activities on what is ultimately quite a dangerous part of our life's lifetimes now. Like if you consider the activities we take part in, most of the danger is now often when we're, we're travelling on, on the roads and that's just because there's a lot of people and we have to share that space. And again, it comes back to um, responsibility and, and British cycling as a member, I have legal support and I'm, in, I'm insured when I'm on the roads and I drive a car as well. I spend more time driving now that I work for British Cycling than riding a bike and so I have insurance in the same way as a, as a, as a normal, uh, as, a, as a car user of the road would do. Just on that point you raised there about how, being a driver as well, that's, that's something else that we can't often get a lot of feedback around um, on our social media channels. Um, you know, when we get discussions between the sort of predominant motorists and predominant cyclists, it's that point around that cyclists mo more often than not are also motorists too. Yeah, and like I said, alas, I am now mainly a motorist rather than a cyclist. My poor, my bike's in my, in my garage on a static tra trainer because I drive for work. So uh, yeah, I, 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 it, it, we've, we've talked a lot about people present it as, a, as this pitched war between cyclists versus drivers almost, and, and sometimes the media can inflame that a little bit. And I think part of what's really important for everyone to understand is that we are all people going about our business that might be working related that might be leisure related and, and, and motorists and cyclists are doing the same things on the road and ultimately often are the same people as well. And I think it's interesting to point out that people who have um, uh, different experiences as road users, as cyclists, motorcyclists, car drivers, um, they're able to appreciate much more um, the perspective of uh, those different road users. And I think, you know, it would encourage people to actually, you know, cycle more so that they can understand how difficult it is to actually um, be safe um, when, when, when other vehicle users don't consider their perspective. Brilliant. Um, Wendy Lawson has been in touch to say, uh, I recently reported a driver who overtook me while signalling right and about to turn at a junction uh, with clear video evidence. I was told this was not an offence. Can you explain why? Also, what is the website for reporting close passes and uploading video? When is the Operation Close Pass running in North Dorset? Joe, do you want to touch on that one for us? Okay, so a couple of issues there. So Ops Snap to start with around dash cam submissions from members of the public. So Operation Snap has been uh, been brought in to try and enable us to, really for members of the public, to help us prosecute more people and make the road safer. 
so by encouraging members of the public to send us footage dash cam of potential offences, um, we can then uh, educate, we can enforce. Um, and we're not saying we're going to pass our job over to the members of the public. It's about saying, well, you know, we've got finite resources. How can we get members of the public to help us? So that's the whole purpose of Operation SNAP. And, and actually it's around trying to influence driver behaviour so that people think before they act. So not only now do, do the drivers have to think, is there a police car behind me? Or is, there, is it marked? Is it unmarked? Is there CCTV? They have to consider, before I do this overtake, before I take this no right turn, before I fail to give way, there's the car behind me, the car in front of me, the car that's on the road got a dash cam. And, and actually, so what we're trying to achieve is that, that road users think before they act because they could get caught in any number of ways. Um, in terms of specific cases, so when people submit uh, evidence via Operation SNAP, it goes through a process of an evidential review. Uh, and it has to meet a certain threshold in order for us to take any further action. So I can't comment on that specific case, but if the evidential threshold isn't met, then we won't take any further action. Uh, and it, so that kind of covers that aspect of it. Uh, and the second part was in terms of Operation Close Pass. So, so that's been running now for, for quite some time. Uh, it's around, again, trying to educate road users to, to give people that space, the appropriate space they need. Uh, so in terms of when is it going to run again, we're, we're conducting operation in late April this year. Uh, and in terms of, of that operation, there's been over 27 uh, events conducted with 15 operations, of which uh, we've educated 30 people in terms of close path. So it's a really good initiative where we're trying to educate people just to give the appropriate amount of space to our vulnerable road users. And, and that approach is happening both in Dorset and Devon and Cornwall? Yes, it is. It's across the, all three counties. And it's something that's been taken up in, in lots of other forces as well. So it's about trying to focus on, on everybody, but you know our vulnerable road users are at significant risk. Um, now, Operation SNAP is something I think we're going to come back to a bit later on because we've got another question around that. But um, uh, looking at bike testing and courses, Christina Davies has asked, many years ago we were forbidden to take bicycles or scooters to school unless we had passed the practical and highway code theory cycling proficiency te test. Uh, is this or something similar still available in schools, Felix? Uh, yes, so before I worked for British Cycling I actually delivered bikeability, which is the what was cycling proficiency effectively and so level one is a traffic free uh, cycle skills course that uh, is for two hours and that's aimed at uh, children uh, at, the, at the age of eight and then bikeability level two is where you get the introduction to cycling on quiet roads which is often around the school environment um, and that is trying to teach children to ride independently whilst understanding the rules of the road and, and, and how to share the space with with the traffic, but also how to cycle confidently and how to how to, to uh, make themselves safe on the road. And we discuss things like we mentioned about being seen. All the stuff we talked about tonight is stuff that's covered within that bikeability level two course. And I know that a lot of um, schools uh, where I'm based up near Bath and North East Somerset, um, the, the delivery is almost every school has some level of bikeability offer um, and I believe that lots of so there are some schools in, in this part of the country as well that they are obl obliging children to have completed the bikeability course before they start cycling to school. Um, in terms of building riders confidence beyond uh, bikeability level two which is a school based uh, level there's also a level three course which uh, like some local authorities or hopefully uh, some other private deliveries can offer which is focused towards secondary school age children and adult riders and, and taking them beyond a quiet road environment and the very basic principles of safe riding and trying to introduce them to how to manage much more busy much more kind of potentially dangerous situations and so there is a provision there and it's, it's varies on area to area how that is kind of managed and delivered but local authorities or private contractors will, will be involved with that delivery. Um, now we touched on um, <coughs> Operation Close Pass, Inspector Pardy earlier. Um, Sharon Smith from Devon and Cornwall has asked, uh, could you not do one with how cyclists should pass a horse safely, uh, not come too abreast, flat out, uh, down the hill past them? Um, no she recently, that, that recently happened to her and no attempt was made to let her know they were coming or when they went past. Um, tell us about the plans and what's been happening around uh, close pass horse. Okay, so there's close pass cycle and there's close pass horse. Uh, and it really goes along a similar trend. What we're trying to do is to make the road safer for everybody. Uh, and of course, uh, horses, uh, I'm not a horse rider myself, but having been to a couple of events, you know, I, there's things I've learned about horses that there's a, they've got severe blind spots directly behind them. So if a cyclist or a car comes airing up behind a horse, they can't see, and of course, a, a horse will always have that kind of flight reaction where it's going to run, 
potentially throw its rider off and cause significant injury. So how do we make people aware of these, of these things? And we talked earlier around bells. If you haven't got a bell, then shout. So again, it's about having respect for the other road users. So this is specifically around how do cycles approach horses. So my answer would be to communicate. If you're coming up behind, slow down. The same with a car driver or another road user coming up behind a horse. Um, or indeed you see a, you know, coming towards a horse, you know, slow down, take your time, don't make loud noises, don't make sudden movements because, you know, a horse of course is an animal um, and it will react differently to how a human would react. So again, it's around the respect for the other people. Um, and in terms of our operation, close pass for horse, horse safe, we are again doing operations around that. It's a bit more difficult in terms of logistics of having a horse. So it's around <laughs> trying to gain the respect and, and trying to educate people around that. And, uh, and we're looking at, at doing that in, in May. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a question directly for yourself, Felix. Uh, Felix from British Cycling. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people cite feeling unconfident on the roads for their decision to do journeys by car and not by bike. Would British Cycling recommend an initiative of a half day's course to teach defensive road skills when taking primary position, how to filter, uh, danger of left turning, HGVs, etc.? It could be combined with a cycling proficiency test. What would be the British Cycling view on that, Felix? So British Cycling have been uh, encouraged by Sport England uh, recently to, to try and lead cycling uh, within, a, within the whole country. And uh, for some time, cycling has become this disparate group with the various different uh, people looking, or organisations looking after the different elements of cycling. Um, and so this question relates very closely to bikeability and well, I mentioned a few moments earlier about the bikeability level three and introducing adult and, and, and teenage riders into how to manage potentially dangerous and potentially complicated uh, traffic situations safely. Um, and that course is very often tailored to the individual rider um, and will be adjusted around their regular route so they can learn how to manage that route safely. Um, in terms of uh, that question was around people using cycling as a journey rather than rather than driving as a journey. But in terms of cycle sport and as a leisure activity, um, one thing that I've always held on to as a mantra since before I was working for British Cycling is that a confident cyclist is a, is a safe cyclist. I think this question about confidence is very important. And uh, there are lots of cycling clubs and um, different opportunities where people can uh, can ride that are will help to build that confidence and, and British Cycling have a fund at the moment which is places to ride and there are lots of new venues and facilities being, being introduced across a range of disciplines that might be mountain biking, that might be um, road cycling in a closed road setting and by building that confidence, that skill set will allow cyclists to feel more able to take their place on the roads and, 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 to, and to ride safely in amongst other road users. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so thanks very much uh, so far. If you've just joined us, uh, you're watching the Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall Police live stream answering your road safety related questions around cycling in particular. Um, we're joined by a panel of experts um, who you can see in the comments uh, who those uh, individuals are. Uh, we're putting a series of questions to them uh, have been submitted into our feeds over the last week. Um, the next kind of group of questions we've got around pedestrians and their relationship with cycling and road safety. Um, so Steve from Devon and Cornwall has asked, why is it that just cyclists need a safe distance? When I go running, I virtually get forced off the road. Lisa, what's your view? Well, um, unfortunately, a lot of behaviour on the road is habitual and uh, people don't actually become consciously aware of what they're doing. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the Alliance and, and certainly Dorset Police um, are very keen to make sure that people are educated and understand um, the behaviours that actually create problems for other people. Um, Brilliant, thank you. Um, Mark's come in uh, on the No Excuse social media account saying, uh, there is a persistent problem with aggressive antisocial cyclists illegally using the pavement across Tuckton Bridge into the Willow Drive, endangering the safety of pedestrians. Joe, uh, tell us how, how people can kind of report road safety issues in their community. Okay, so firstly, to, to deal with the issue of cycling on the pavement, it's, it's unlawful, it's illegal to do so. And again, you, could, you know, a cyclist could be subject to a fine. Uh, if there's specific issues in your in your neighbourhood, then I'd ask you either to contact us via uh, 101, and that's across the three counties, or indeed you can contact your neighbourhood policing team, uh, and we can obviously consider that uh, in terms of other demands. So, if there's specific antisocial behaviour that needs to be dealt with, then we can uh, then we can deal with that. There's also the opportunity to report via Dorset Road Safe if needs be, 
uh, and we can you know, look at educating, maybe going to the schools to speak to them. So it's, there's lots of avenues to go down. It's not necessarily all about enforcement. Uh, so, so hopefully that answers that question. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so looking at the next one, uh, some cyclists, this is Brenda Roberts, has asked some cyclists think they have the right of way on the pavement and pedestrians should move out of the way. Uh, they don't even use a bell. As someone who is hard of hearing, this can be very dangerous for me. Uh, I thought it was illegal to ride on the pavements. Is this correct, Felix? Uh, yes, it is illegal to ride on the pavements. And again, I think confidence is, it comes back to, um, to the pre one question a few moments ago is that often why cyclists end up on the pavement is often a lack of confidence or they don't feel like they are having the road shared with them or they don't feel like they're going to be in a safe place on the road. And so I think that a lot of what we're trying to talk about today is, is around this, this tolerance and, and, and making sure that we aren't putting ourselves ahead of the safety of the other people we're sharing the space with and that goes for cyclists in a shared space and, and adjusting the way that you ride if you are on a, a space where you are allowed to ride on a, on a space that you'll be sharing with pedestrians and then that cascades on to other road users that when cyclists are on the, on the, on the main carriageway that you've got um, the other road users adjusting their, their, their use of the, the vehicle or, and to, to keep the vulnerable road users safe. Brilliant, thank you. So we've covered uh, a number of key areas there around cycling um, from a variety of different uh, means and, and issues that are raised, particularly around social media and issues that affect both drivers, motorcyclists, riders, pedestrians, all manner of road users. So we've, we've kind of covered a lot of the road safety cycling themes there. So we're just going to open it up now to a few uh, wider elements. Uh, Stuart has asked, uh, I was involved in a collision with a BMW on the A30 last July while cycling from Bristol to Land's End. I was left with a very long and hard recovery and the driver got a mere six points and a £347 fine for driving without care and attention. Why is the penalty so small considering I was left for dead in a ditch? Joe. Okay, so um, in terms of the, of the penalty that's given by court, they're, they're bound by sentencing guidelines. Uh, so in terms of, of any influence, you know, we can't really influence the sentencing guidelines. All I'll be clear is that if people are involved in the collision, then we'll review the evidence and where it needs to be, people will be sent to court and prosecuted for that. Uh, so, you know, I'm satisfied that there was a driver there who was taken to court and, and saw justice for, for their, their actions on the road, which was clearly careless. In terms of a penalty, it's very difficult. That's, that's bound by sentencing guidelines. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Felix mentioned earlier from his own personal experience around insurance. You know, car drivers are insured. So, uh, you know, whilst I sympathise with that, um, that person for the injuries they've sustained, and, you know, there, there are other means through insurance that, that can, be, can be taken forward to hopefully help that person recover fully. And, and I, picking up on that point, yeah, yeah Felix, so you were talking about insurance. Tell us a bit more about that. And when I was, so I was hit by a driver in, in 2017, uh, and I didn't realise the rights I had to, to claim for the injuries that I received, and I received scarring on my face and, and, and was taken away in an ambulance. But off, on my own devices, I, I had no idea what to do. And so actually having insurance was actually the more, more valuable thing was actually having the legal support that came with that insurance to then um, proceed with a claim as per the as per the guidelines as, as I would have a right to. So um, I think it was even for me having been quite closely involved with cycling for a number of years, I didn't I wasn't aware of what I was able to do. And so um, I think it's a really important thing to people to, to bear in mind and British cycling membership is one way to kind of to achieve that insurance and there are other ways to do that as well. Brilliant, thank you. So um, earlier Inspector Pardy we touched on um, Operation Snap. Uh, John Richards uh, from the Exeter Cycling Campaign has asked, uh, I've had my faith, or he said, I've had my faith in Operation Snap restored uh, with a positive response to a submission. Hopefully Inspector Pardee can provide us some statistics and tell us how many submissions have been made, actioned and resulted in prosecutions since the initiative started. Joe, do you want to run us through some of the figures that we've got? Yeah, sure. So again, Op Snap is a, is a really good way for us to, to capture uh, members of the public's dash cam because it, more and more people got dash cam and the more and more we can use that that evidence to to make our roads safety is brilliant so so far since operation snap came into force which was around about july last year we've had over 1300 submissions uh, and around uh, between a, th a third and a quarter have, have resulted in a, in a positive outcome uh, and so that's across both forces that's across all three counties both forces uh, so it's a really positive step because those uh, my math isn't brilliant right here, but a third of that, of that um, 1,300, we would never have had those without Operation Snap. So actually, we've, while people might say, well, that's not enough, uh, we've got strict evidential thresholds that we've got to meet. Um, but safe in the knowledge that those third have been educated or prosecuted um, 
for, for their driving standards. So I think it's absolutely brilliant. And you can report uh, and submit dash cam footage via both uh, force websites, uh, both on Devon and Cornwall Police and Dorset Police. It will give you a link to the OpSnap portal. And, and just touching on that, you mentioned the outcomes there. We've had roughly a, a third of um, outcomes as a result of uh, dash cam submissions. Just run us through what those outcomes would be. What, what could um, be the potential penalties if um, uh, someone submits some dash cam footage to us? So we've got a number of options available to us um, in terms of positive outcomes. Uh, there's education courses that people can go on. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we try and get as many people into education as we can. Uh, if the driving standard is that poor, then they'll be prosecuted and go to court. And uh, depending on severity of, of the manner of driving, whether it's careless or dangerous, uh, it could result in a, in a small fine and points, or it could result in disqualification or even a prison sentence for the most severe cases. So there's a whole wide range of options available to us. And clearly what, what we want to do is educate, but if it's that bad, people will go to court, plain and simple. Thank you. Um, so uh, Jonathan Parkins has uh, asked, uh, my question to Dorset Police, as both a driver and cyclist, I would like to know what, why you don't just encourage mutual respect between all road users. Now, um, as an employee of Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall Police, I'd like to think that we that's exactly what we're doing. Um, so I'd like to put that question to Lisa. Um, yourself as a, an external party, you're an expert in behaviour change and psychology, um, Dr Lisa Dawn. Um, just tell us what your views are as an external partner about um, how we're working to sort of change behaviours and encourage mutual respect. Well, uh, I think we've covered um, that actually... Um, Dorset Police and certainly uh, Devon and Cornwall too, doing a wide range of different interventions for all sorts of road users. Um, you know, we've heard about um, some of the work with uh, people who are passing too closely. We've heard about some of the driver diversion courses, and um, there are also uh, there's also work in schools working with 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 a whole range of different road users. It's not just about one isolated group that that, that gets focused on. And, and certainly working with the Dorset Police in particular as a, an independent researcher, um, it's clear to me that there's, a, there's, 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 there's not just a focus on one particular group. Brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, Steve has asked, we often see your mobile safety vans throughout the area. When on dual carriageways, do they differentiate between various classes of vehicles that have different speed limits on the type of roads? Now, uh, James, uh, you deliver to the driver awareness scheme to many, many drivers and quite a few of those may have been on the course as a result of their speed. Uh, I think the vast majority of the course attendees are a result of their speeding. Um, just run us through um, how the cameras work and how they can um, are able to differentiate between different vehicle classes and speed limits. I think that what we need to look at <coughs> excuse me, is across the alliance, um, wherever we have detection, something's gone wrong. Um, or the, the community got such a concern that they've asked for um, the, the police to go down there and, and do some enforcement. Um, I, th I think with, with as far as, as vehicles concerned, yes, cameras can see vehicles a long, long way away. Very often on the course, um, we get told that we hide cameras. Um, they can't be hidden because they need to land on the vehicle to get the laser on the vehicle to judge what speed it's doing. Um, so I, I think in a lot of times people think that the cameras are there just as a, as a revenue um, a revenue stream uh, but they are there for safety and yes they can tell the difference between a motor vehicle a van or, or a truck and what we get a lot on the course is is a lot of people don't realize the speed limit of their vehicle um, a lot of people have been driving vans for for many many years um, doing 70 for argument's sake on a, on a dual carriageway where their speed limit is 60 and they'd be getting away with it for a long long time and then they get agreed when they come on a course and they get it wrong um, but we're working a lot, uh, very closely with with Elisa Dawn for, for all of our courses and it's all about behaviour and, and having respect for every other road user on the road I think if everybody looked at the qualities of someone like a good person and took those qualities and used them on the road and respected everybody else I think everybody would get on a little better. And, and just on that point of um, a ten percent, sorry, ten miles an hour lower for most um, speed categories. Um, what some of the, the feedback you get on the course? Because um, I know quite a few people who attend. They might have been driving a panel van that's been on hire, for example, moving house or that sort of thing, and they don't quite realise they're changing speed. Is that right? Um, first of all, they don't know they're going higher speed, but also it's quite confusing. Um, because we, the manufacturers have made it quite confusing by giving us many different types of vehicles. Uh, when the rule first came out, it was quite understandable that uh, a commercial vehicle was a commercial vehicle. 
but now there are lots of vehicles that can land in the commercial vehicle stage and they can also be a, a car driver. Um, you get vehicles like your, your, uh, your, your pickups and you've got the, the Volkswagen Caravelle and the, the Transport and all those types of vehicles. Um, although they're different vehicles, they can be different speeds. Because it it, it's based on the weight, isn't it? It's based on the weight of the vehicle and also what it's used for. Uh, if it's registered as a com commercial vehicle, it'll be 10 miles an hour less on a dual carriageway and um, a national speed limit road, which will clearly for cars is 60, and for vans and commercial vehicles is 50. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so the final question we've taken from the uh, questions that were submitted in advance, uh, Charlie Jackson uh, asked, is there anything that we can do if we catch someone on their phones while driving? Um, I know Joe Pardy, Inspector Joe Pardy, touched on this earlier around dash cam um, and the submissions. It's a little bit challenging that around uh, use of mobile phones. Um, Charlie asked, can we use our dash cams or register the number plate and time that it was uh, seeing the offence? What's your view? Okay, so in terms of uh, dash cam and mobile phone offences, uh, I talked around an evidential threshold. So, so the legislation talks around the use of a mobile phone. Um, so in terms of if we see uh, dash cam footage with somebody uh, using a phone, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, get the evidence to prove usage of the phone. So um, whilst it's very frustrating, I would still urge people to, to let us know so that we can uh, consider sending letters if, if needs be. Uh, it's very difficult to prosecute people for using their phone without it being an interaction with a police officer at, uh, at the side of the road. Brilliant, thank you. Um, if you're just joining us, um, this is the feed across Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall Police looking at road safety questions that you've submitted to us in advance. We've been going for quite some time now. We've been um, answering your questions for almost an hour now. Um, so we're nearly time to wrap this up. But what we wanted to do is just take a quick look at some of the comments that have been coming in on the feed itself that you've been uh, commenting. Um, and just looking through these now, let's have a look. Uh, Katrina um, Vernon, she asks, I'm a mum of a one-year-old. What type of bike seat trailer is safe to use? So there's a whole range of different uh bikes available now. In fact, I think one of the amazing things is the, the bike industry has really broadened the offer and, and we aren't in a position where we're having to lash on child seats to conventional bicycles the whole time. Um, I think that it, it, de it depends slightly on, on, on the specific rider you are and the specific circumstances. Um, you can buy tag-along trailers behind, but obviously you, you won't be able to, to see, and I, whenever I see those, that makes me a little bit un uneasy seeing an extra, extra kind of tag-along behind. You can get some pretty amazing cargo bikes. In fact, there is a, a, a woman that cycles near, near me, takes her three children to school, sitting in the front of this, uh, this large kind of transporter bike. And, uh, and I, I think if, if, you were looking, if I was looking to transport a, a, a single or number of young children in the front of a bicycle, that would be the one I'd choose. So it's kind of a, a cargo bike is the way to, you'd, if you were searching for it online. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Lindsay has been in touch to say, as a cyclist, it annoys me that the other cyclists have been seen to ignore red lights and not use the cycle pass, not having a helmet, lights or a bell. Um, it's interesting that we've got cyclists passing those comments as well. Felix, what, what have you got so to say? So there's a that? really interesting uh, case in where I grew up in London, which is there's Regent's Park, there's a, there's, a, there's a route which was used a lot by sports cyclists around the perimeter of the park, and it, and it got to the point where the locals were caught referring to it as a velodrome. Um, and actually, what this was exactly one of the, the grievances that was raised, and, and, and the cyclists almost took it upon themselves and started to self-enforce in a way, um, and without wanting to... they they, they the, the leaders of the cycling groups really proactively um, try to encourage those in their network to kind of to, to, to build a message of, of following the rules around that red lights and, and understanding that the impact that a small minority of cyclists breaking the rules has on the vast majority that, that do follow follow uh, the rules of the road. And I think this is the same across all different road users is that there is a minority that, uh, that flaunt the rules which then makes it worse for the rest of the users and I think this was a really interesting case where the, 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 the rest of the cycling community proactively worked together to try and to crack this where the minority became a very small minority that were almost so embarrassed to jump a red light when there were five or six other cyclists there obediently waiting. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Jane Kerry has asked, any update on cycling along the beachfront in summer? Uh, Joe, uh, I know there's certain bylaws around um, cycling on the seafront, what's your, what's, what's your views on that one? Uh, I don't need to answer the question. Uh, but in terms, you know, again, it, it goes back down to, you know, we had discussions around cyclists and pedestrians. Um, you know, if, if they do make it uh, legal to ride a pedal cycle along a, a seafront, then 
you just got to be aware of your surroundings, the same as you know pedestrians need to keep an eye out as well. So it's just about that mutual respect, and I think so many of these these issues are about just having respect for other people. And I think if um, you know if, if we can all just respect each other, then the roads will be a safer and better place. Uh, Raymond uh, McLaren has uh, commented, "Why build cycle paths when cyclists would rather die than use them?" Um, it's an interesting view. Um, it's something we've already touched on earlier in the video. Felix, as, as a cyclist, do you want to touch on that? So I think, I think realistically, the cycle paths are, are not built for a confident cyclist necessarily. They're built to facilitate making it easier for more people to choose an active travel uh, choice that will hopefully have a huge amount of impacts that might include uh, a better environmental impact, a better impact on the number of people using private vehicles and the traffic and, and so on that is associated with that. So um, the reason for cycle paths and the infrastructure that gets put in for cycling is to support those that currently aren't riding bikes to get on their bike because they may not have the confidence to use roads as per an, an, any other road user. And, and I think in terms of the comment about, you know, would the cyclists rather get killed? Well. You know, we're all trying to work together to reduce the amount of people who are killed and seriously injured on our roads, no matter who you are. And, and, and I really think we all have got a part to play in that. You know, as the police, we look to educate and enforce. Uh, partners, you know, we're looking at um, behavioural specialists to help us, to try and get the message out there up snap to get people to help us. So, you know, we've all got a responsibility to road users to make sure people aren't killed and seriously injured. I see it too often, it's not acceptable. Uh, so we all need to work together and uh, so no one goes out with the intention of either being killed or killing other people on the roads and we need to change that. Uh, now it's a subject that we touched on earlier around shared space. Um, Martin Owen has asked shared paths such as Exmouth Seafront should have a speed limit. Uh, cyclists, pedestrians, buggies, dog walkers and runners it's an absolute nightmare. Um, what, what's your views on, on speed limits around um, shared spaces in particular? So there's a I'm from a different part of the country, but there is a this this exact conversation around the the shared use path between Bristol and Bath, which is a very heavily used commuter route. Um, and I think the, the clue is in the name; it's a shared path, and we are sharing responsibility to use it safely. And I think it's a slightly, for want of a better word, selfish approach of I'm me and I'm going to do my thing and not appreciating the other people that are around you that is where these things start to come from and we've spoken a lot about tolerating and seeing this from the other user's point of view and I think that's kind of where this has to come through is that no matter whether you are the pedestrian, the cyclist or whatever else it might be, if you can see the situation from the other person's point of view you'll hopefully be able to adjust your behaviour so that actually you make sure it's safe for everyone. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think we've reached the end of our feed now. Um, you've been watching the Dorset Police and Devon and Cornwall feed. We just wanted to sort of finish on a point that was raised um, by Louisa Rose Baker on the Devon and Cornwall page. Uh, she said she'd saddened by the negative comments uh, for cyclists, but she's, she says of a society where we have more in common than what divides us and we believe we get somewhere and return safely home to our loved ones. Um, now, it's a really nice uh, point to finish on. Everyone's sharing the road space. Uh, as a pedestrian, as a cyclist, as a horse rider, as a motorist. Um, we're all involved in the roads and uh, this initiative primarily has been about educating um, all road users, um, both cyclists, drivers and other road users, and kind of really trying to build that relationship and break down some of those myths that have been touched on. So um, it's a really nice point to finish on. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, please leave your feedback in the comments and uh, thanks for joining us.